obviously Fightville, right? I, I watched it again. I remember when Fightville first came out. I watched it when it first came out. I watched it again last night because it's been a while. And it's funny because in the doc, you said, I think you were 20, and you said uh, your dream was to be the greatest 155-pound fighter of all time. And eventually when you get to the UFC and WEC, you're at 145 pounds. How close do you feel like you are to that goal that you set out for yourself when you were 20 years old? I think I'm knocking on the door, bro. I think uh, if I win this undisputed belt June 1st, I mean, you stack my resume against any other 155er. I mean, I think I'm close, you know. Have you been able to step outside of yourself? Because when you're still fighting, you're kind of in it, right? And you look at it, you're the only person who's beat Conor twice. You've probably fought more number one or top five pound for pound fighters than any other fighter in the organization. You've defeated Max Holloway twice, who's arguably the greatest featherweight of all time, with or without the title. Do you still are you still satisfied with your career, or do you have to have that title to cement yourself? I mean, I think that title cements it. I think not only does the title cement my my life's work. It, it also locks in a Hall of Fame, I feel, a, a Hall of Fame resume. Uh, maybe one day I'll be in the Hall of Fame. Like it, I think a lot of things depend on that title to, to be 100%. But, you, you know, my mindset, man, like I'm going to go into the unknown June 1st. When I make that walk, anything can happen, you know, good or bad. It's what we do. That's the dice. That's the, that's the game we play walking out there every single time. And that's part of why I still love this so much is because you don't know you can do all the work and you don't know what's going to happen when those lights come on and the bell rings. It's, it's a rush. It's exciting, but I'm in a spot where I'm old enough to, to think about my whole career and understand I don't have, I have more behind me than I have in front of me for sure. So I have to be content with whatever's going to happen. And if I say today, I put down the gloves and I never pick them back up right now. I'm proud of everything I've accomplished. I'm, a, I'm, I'm proud of the life I provided for my family. I'm provide. I'm I'm proud of the the way I've used my platform for people whose voice isn't heard. I'm proud of a lot of things. You know, I uh, I did more than I thought I I would. You know, not that I would. I didn't think I was going to make it. It's just uh, when I step back and look at the the my record and the things that I've done throughout my career, I'm appreciative, man. Dude, I got to go back to something you just said. You think you'll make the Hall of Fame? Bro, if, I mean, it feels pretty pretty locked in at this point, right? I mean, I know you're being modest, but come on, man. There's other people who haven't accomplished half the things that you have that have been in the Hall of Fame. They were probably world champions. <laughs> but I mean, the reality of it is all world champions aren't the same, right? Like, there are world champions who... I don't want to say they fell into the opportunity, but they may have had never had a title defense, right? A lot of people say you don't, you're not a champion until you have a title defense. I think we could stack your resume up to plenty of champions, and you've beaten former champions, and say that your career as a whole might be better than people who have actually held a world title. I love to hear that respect, man. Uh, I appreciate you. Yeah, no problem. Um, it also, in the documentary, uh, Gil says very early in it, he's like, there are some people that'll fight and have one fight, right? And you're going to be lucky if you can have 20 to 30 fights. When you fight Islam, that's your 40th MMA fight. 40th. Which is kind of crazy. I know it's like, you can't see the forest from the trees when you're young. But did, did you ever fathom yourself having 40 professional fights? I, I didn't look that far. You know, I didn't look that far. But I have a bunch of fights that aren't on my, my record. You know, I have nine, nine or ten more fights that aren't even on my record. That's why you know, I have 50 fights. Damn. And 30, this will be 31 in the UFC. And on top of that, I have fights in the WC. So I've been fight. I got into the WC at five and zero or six and zero. So from that point on the next 32 or whatever it is, 33 fights, whatever has been against the best guys in the world. You know, it, it's one thing to have 40 pro fights and, and 25 of them are on the local circuit or on small shows, but the bulk of my professional career has been in the biggest organizations in the world and against the best people in the world. So I hang my hat on that for sure. You don't have to do this anymore. You've made enough money financially. You could walk away and be totally fine. When was the day that you realized that? And then when was the day that you also said, but I'm not necessarily sure 
what I'll do when I step away from this sport. Cause uh, usually they come hand in hand, right? Like, cause you spent your whole life wanting to be a fighter and you've accomplished everything. But the idea of walking away, even though you're financially secure, how do you balance those two things? Whenever I, 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 you know, and even before this last fight, I was in a spot where I didn't, I don't have to fight anymore. So that's what it has to be for me to step in there. It has to be something more than just a fight because I've done that 50 times. You know, like it has to be something more than just a fight. It has to be an opportunity or it, it has to be something more than just a fist fight. You know, I, I'm 35 years old with a family. I've done it 50 times. And uh, that last fight in Miami against Benoit St. Denis was to prove to myself that I still belong and still can do it with the best guys, the young up and comers. And then obviously I got that win and this came around. And I owe it to myself to step in there and try to become the world champion. How many times have you looked at a matchup for yourself? Like the St. Denis matchup was like, I see what the UFC is doing here. Like I see that they're, they're testing yeah. me to see if I still got it. And with that, have you entered, have you ever doubted yourself before a fight? I mean, I know I'm not dumb. Like I, when I was young, ignorance is bliss. So like I would go into fights. There's no way this guy's, ever going to beat me on his best day or my worst day. He cannot do it. But then you grow through life and you have so many fights and you go into fights feeling like that and lose. And then you go into fights feeling like I'm busted up from training camp. I overworked myself and then I win. Or, you know, it's just, it's so crazy that I'm just a realist with it. Like, I think I can beat anybody in the world, but on any Saturday night under those lights, it can go bad as well. This is fighting the best guys in the world where the margin for error is so small. You make one mistake and you wake up looking at the lights or you, you're stuck in a submission that you can't get out of and you you know it's checkmate. It's just such a high-level game at, on this stage that we play. I, I just understand and accept all that every time I walk out there. You know, like, it, it is what it is. I put myself in the best position to be victorious. But at the end of the day, there's a little bit of, of dice rolling, you know? Yeah, early in your career, you, uh, going back to the Fightville Doc, you said you're not scared of losing, right? But you also don't know how to deal with it when you finally do lose. Do you remember your first loss and how you felt? And do you remember when you were able to accept losses as lessons rather than being really hard on yourself? I'm still, you know, I'm still struggling with that. Everyone, it breaks my heart. You know, I feel like it's not real when I go to the locker room. Like, I can't believe that that I lost. You know, I just worked that hard and believe in myself that much. And, and But I'm human. And so is Islam. And June 1st, we're going to do it. Uh, I want to go back to the financially secure question for a minute. Now, when you first start fighting, you just want to fight. But then you start making money. And then you have sponsors. You have like Celsius sponsoring you. Obviously, you have the shirt on. How does it feel to know that there are companies that back you, that support you? This isn't necessarily something that you think about when you're 20 years old. But now that you're older and you see that the people have your back and companies support you, how does that feel? It feels good, especially like I would say 95, maybe more of the companies and, and partnerships I have, I've aligned with myself with them because it's it's actually organic. I was drinking the product or I was using Samsung or boxing with Everlast gloves. Like a lot of this stuff kind of or wearing these colorful Robert Graham shirts that I wear. A lot of these partnerships I have are because I'm actually using the product and they see me with it in my hand or they get wind of it somehow. And, and we we form a partnership. So that's I'm proud of myself for that. And younger fighters, I think if I can help you in any way with sponsorship stuff, try to align yourself with brands that you really actually use on a daily basis. So it's not like a counterfeit thing. It's not like you're lying to the to the people when you're taking a picture. You know, anybody can do that. So I, I'm I'm proud of myself for that. I'm curious. I, I mean, with Celsius, uh, you know, there's a lot of energy drinks out there. Why why them? Why, why, why does this work for you? Well, I was drinking them when I was still living in Louisiana. Me and my wife started drinking Celsius a long time ago. The labels, the cans, everything was different back then. Then I started training here in Coconut Creek, and I find out that their headquarters is 20 minutes from my gym in Boca Raton. And then the ball got rolling. I kept getting bigger fights, started talking to the company, and it, and it just fell into place. You know, nothing – I wouldn't say any of my sponsorships, especially with Celsius, but any of my sponsorships, nothing was forced or, like, overextended myself trying to reach out for their attention to get a deal. It was all stuff that just really happened because I was, I was using the product or I enjoyed the, the, the product, you know, 
So that that I love that part about the sponsorships I have. Perfect. All right. So let's pivot back to UFC 302 real quick. Uh, Lafayette Street, your daughter's going to be there at the fight. Does this feel in your mind like, well, if if there was a better story to write, how does it get any better than this? Fighting the Prudential Center for the lightweight title with your daughter sitting in the front row on a street that's Lafayette Street, which references your hometown. Beautiful. It's perfect. It, uh, it just feels right. You know, I actually, I just got back from the gym uh, before I hopped on this call. I just did some drilling with Mike Brown and ran three miles after, showered up at the gym and came home. And a guy, a fan uh, was in the parking lot here, got out of his car, came up to me. He said, man, me and all my boys keep talking about it. You're going to pull it off. We just had this feeling you're going to knock him out. I'm like, things just feel right going into this one, you know? Maybe third time's a charm. I've been in there with the best. I, I got a lot of experience under my belt. Mentally and physically, I'm in a good spot. And I'm ready to go. You know, maybe maybe it's time. Like, is, I is said, it... like I said over and over again, destiny doesn't make mistakes. What's meant for me won't miss me. If this is my destiny, if this is supposed to happen, I'm going to put in the work like I've always done. I'm going to take care of my body, take care of my mind, leading into this fight week. And I'm going to go out there and give it all I got like I do every one. And if it's supposed to happen, it's going to happen, and I'll be the world champion. Is there something uh, comforting in the idea that Islam says you're lucky to get this opportunity and he may be overlooking you? That I don't know if it takes the pressure off, because obviously the pressure's still there, but the idea that this man, who has lost a fight before, is, is, he's not undefeated, is coming into this situation saying, that you may not deserve this opportunity. I don't know if that motivates you. I don't know what that does for you. It's just noise. You know, at this point in my career, bro, it's all noise. What really matters is 25 minutes, June 1st, on that canvas inside that octagon. That's what really, really matters. Everything else is just bumping gums and means nothing. But for him to say that, like, that's that's silly. You know, I've, I've been in the UFC over a decade fighting the best of the best. I've been in the top 10, top five for years and years and years fighting the best. I've held my spot. I've allowed in my last fight new up and comers to get a crack at this position. Took them out. You know, I earned this spot. I want to ask you about your wife real quick because I've been with my wife for since like shortly after high school. And sometimes our significant others, they can either be our biggest supporters or indirectly, they can be a detriment to our career because it can get in the way of our relationship. Right. How has your wife been able to handle this as your career? Because she's been there since it was nothing. And now she's she's there. She's here now. And I mean, you haven't gone like this is it. This is your your unity. And this is your daughter's here in the front row. Talk about how how her support has been detrimental to your success. I mean, she drove me to my first. I don't I didn't have a car. She drove me to my first amateur fight ever, you know, and stayed with me in a in a a shitty hotel, you know, like drove me to weigh ins. Like that's we've been doing this together since since I started fighting. Um, in a couple months we're gonna make it's 15 years we've been married. Already got a little trip planned, so looking forward to that. But I wouldn't be here. She, she's an anchor. I wouldn't have made it as far as I've made it in fighting without my wife. A hundred percent, hundred percent. She believes in me more than I believe in me. I mean. Like I said, man, sometimes, you know, there's has she ever urged you to retire? Has she ever asked you when's the last one or is she just here for the ride and to support you no matter what your decision is? Whatever my decision is, she's going to be back behind it 100 percent. But she wants me she wants me to move on from fighting when I feel like I've done what I wanted to do. You know, she's with me on that part. Is there some I hate asking this question because you don't know exactly how you're going to feel. But is there a scenario that you win at UFC 302 because there's nothing left? Could you retire as a champion? Is there? Yeah. Could you see that? That could happen, yeah. Because seriously, and I ask this, and I'm not asking this facetiously, but what is left? Is there anything else that you need to do to feel, feel validated, or is this the last step in your career? For me, this is the last box unchecked on, on my to-do list in mixed martial arts, for sure. That I mean, you don't hear that from a lot of people. They want to do, they fight too long or they feel still feel like there's something to prove or they feel like there's another target to go after. You don't have that at all outside of this. 
I don't have that at all. I feel like I've, I've checked all the boxes except undisputed. That's a box I want checked. And that's a box I've been, all these other boxes got checked by me chasing that. All these other things are byproduct of me trying to be the best in the world on one night. And I'm still chasing that. You know, I, I have a UFC interim belt at home that says UFC world champion, Dustin Poirier, 155 pounds. I have that on my, at my house in Louisiana, but I want the undisputed strap and to tell my wife, I did it. I'm undisputed world champion, the best in the world. Like I told you I was going to be when I was 17 years old. That's all I want. That's all I want to do. That's insane, man. Um, Tim Crater in the documentary mentions that we're not here to make world champions or the greatest of all time. We're here to make better men. I think you're one of the prime examples of an individual who has become one of the best individuals in the sport, right? In terms of community, giving back. Nobody ever has anything bad to say about you ever. How much do you owe your life to MMA to becoming a changed man was not just about fighting, it's about giving back and about being an upstanding individual. I found who I am through fighting. My life has been molded in some way or another by fighting. You know, everything I have is from 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 fighting. Everything me and my family have, the businesses I own, things that we run, like everything I have is anchored into fighting somehow got me there or got me into the into the room or business meetings or tables with these people I would have never had an opportunity to sit across from and talk to to make things happen. It's all because of fighting. Fighting has opened these doors for me. And to be honest, I, I could be dead or in jail if I never found fighting. You know, when I was 17 years old, I, was, I, I wasn't doing the right things. And I've learned a lot of lessons about myself, about business, about life through fighting. And I'm, I'm, I'm proud of that too, you know, because I've always asked questions and listened to people who I, I respected and thought had knowledge about something that I was interested in. And that's pretty much what I did my whole fighting career and that taught me how to do that in my business career as well, to ask questions to the Robbie Lawlers, to the Junior DeSantos, to the George Masvidal's, the Tiago Alves, Mike Brown, people that I put myself in rooms with when I came to American Top Team and picked their brains and, and found out, I, I want to walk the path that they, they're successful at this. They've made a name. How do I do it? Let me see more intricate pieces of how they did it. And, and that's what I've always been, you know, just a, a student, you can say. Do you remember when you decided or knew that there's more to fighting than just fighting, that you can do some of these other things? Did anybody teach you that or did you figure it out on your own? I think my mindset really started to switch whenever I had my daughter, mm. you know, almost eight years ago. When I had her, I realized fighting is just part of my life. But before that, my identity was fighting. It was who I was, but I'm not, you know, like that's just something I do. Fighting is something I do. Uh, that I enjoy, that I, I provide for my family with, I help other people with because I have a platform where people are listening on these interviews and talking on ESPN and all these big, big stages. I can talk about things where people are going to hear me. So fighting has done a lot of that for me, but it's just something I do. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a business owner, a son, a brother. I'm a lot of things. Fighting is just not who I am. It's something I do. And having a daughter kind of put things into perspective for me. I'm a girl dad too. So I, I kind of understand this, right? Like when you have a daughter, it's different, right? I just had a son about two years ago. I love him to death, but my daughter is like Congrats. stole my heart. <laughs> like the little girls steal your heart. But for you, the decision for her to sit ringside for this particular fight, was it a difficult decision to make? Or how did you, how did you decide that? I, I know this is the last time I'm going to fight for a world title to get a chance to become the undisputed champion. This is going to be the last time I get to walk, make that walk. She's about to be eight years old. I never let her watch fights live. You know, mm. it, she's only been to one fight when I fought Charles Oliveira, but she didn't get to watch live. She was in the back with, in a private room with a sitter. There was no TV stream in the fight or anything like that. So she didn't know what was going on. And even like when family, like my mother watches her whenever I go fight sometimes and they don't allow her to watch the pay-per-view live because we don't know what's going to happen. It's, it's right. tough. Fighting is tough. It's the hurt business. And to see your father, your role model, or somebody in your mind you think is a superhero, you know, to see them bleeding and getting hurt, I don't think it's good for a kid. But just where I'm at in my life and, and in the sport and her age, I feel like, and she was born into fighting. So she kind of understands what's going on and she knows that I come home with stitches and she knows I get beat up at the gym and come home with black eyes. And she understands more now that she's a little bit older. And I just don't want to take that from her childhood of 
one chance to feel that energy in the arena. I think she's old enough and mature enough at, 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 as she can be for a seven year old kid to understand and enjoy this, this journey. And I just don't want her, I don't want to look back and say, I wish she could have witnessed this, or I wish she could have felt this energy and been in the arena. I, I, I want to give it to her now, you know, and we'll see how it goes. It's interesting because, you know, a lot of fighters say that they need to separate those two worlds, right? Training camp, fighting family, right? Like, they, they got to be separate. But as you mentioned, your daughter was born into it. Your wife drove you to your first amateur fight. This seems like you couldn't really have it any other way. Like you have to gift her this opportunity, especially now because my daughter's seven. So their memories actually truly kick in where they remember everything. And this seems like the perfect opportunity. But does it add any more pressure to, for you to perform knowing that she's going to be there? I don't think so. I don't think so. We kind of move as a unit regardless. Like I feel they're back home right now. She's finishing up school. I feel kind of out of sync with them not being here with me through training camp. Like we've always done it as a family, me and my wife, seven years ago when my daughter was born, it's always been a family thing. Obviously they're not in the locker room with me and stuff, but my wife's with me fight week, you know, my wife and daughter with me all training camp. So it just is what it is. I don't, I don't have to move those things apart and keep them separate. It, it's fighting his life. A couple more for you. One, there was a time after the, the third Conor McGregor fight where it felt inevitable that you two were going to cross paths again. Is that ship completely sailed now in your mind? I think so. I do think he beats Chandler, though. Okay. And if, if the UFC did come calling for that fight one more time, is it something that you consider, or is it kind of like, especially considering how contentious the bill was to that fight, do you need that energy in your life at this point? I don't need that energy, man. I just need the strap. That's all I need. Okay. Uh, the last question. Look, man, storybook career, or storybook life. Is there going to be a book <laughs> at some point? Because it feels like you have to share this with people. Because we've seen you on the outside. We've watched you fight. We've seen a documentary about you and your origins of fighting. But it feels like it's only natural for you to have a book at some point to tell your true story from your perspective. Is that is that possible? I, I feel like I should, man, because I have so much things in my mind that I've never spoken to in interviews, you know, spoken about in interviews or opened up publicly. So many different things that I've been challenged with, with me against me throughout the years. And uh, yeah, if I, if I ever did write a book, I'd like to open up on a lot of the journeys I've had through fighting, both physically on the fight path, but also mentally against myself. Because man, it's been a fight. It's been a constant fight. I've been at war with these top fighters and I've been at war with myself for the past 17 years as well. Uh, is there, if I had to put you on the spot and ask what the title of your book would be, do you have something in mind? Paid in full. <laughs> I like it. Paid in full. The story of El Diamante. Boom. That's it. We're going to make that. I think we, we need to make that happen, Dustin. I, listen, man, I appreciate the time. Um, good luck. I'll be out there, obviously. Uh, hopefully I get a chance to see you during fight week. But thank you again for the time. I know you could be doing a lot of other things, but sitting here talking to me. So I appreciate that. Oh, good, man. Thanks for having me on. 